Good evening and a big welcome here to tonight's uh, Earth Convention brought to you by us who are 5 by 15 with Rathbone's Investment Management. Tonight we're going to be talking about biodiversity and I'm incredibly pleased that our first speaker tonight is Professor Patek Das Gupta who has just authored a very long awaited report into the economics of biodiversity. This is a hugely significant thing because for many reasons, but a big one is that this report was not commissioned as many environment ones are by the Department of Food and Rural Affairs by DEFRA. This was commissioned by our treasury. And in fact, this makes us here the first country in the world who's tried to look at this. But of course, there are many questions. Are, are we finally beginning to understand that nature, not just uh, happy rabbits and nice flowers, but it actually supplies a service that has a value, and that has limits. And basically we've taken it for granted. We take the air, the water, the climate, the stability and the food. Do we actually yet understand that all the systems on earth from microbes in the soil to the way that oceans can regulate and draw down carbon, that they're fundamental to how we live and how we prosper. And that our economies are embedded within nature. They're not something external to nature. So if that's so, how do we deal with this? How do we pay for it? And of course, this is not without controversies that I know we're going to get into tonight. I mean, many people ask, how do you put a market value on something that is essentially priceless and that in the end belongs to all of us? So before we begin, I'd just like to say a big thank you to Rathbones for being such brilliant partners in all of this. Rathbones really are an investment management company that looks at tomorrow rather than the short term of today. And this could not be more important now. Um, we're always impressed by how far ahead of the government many businesses basically mm -hmm. are. And I'm thrilled that so many of you are here with us tonight. Since we began this series uh, in September, the numbers of people joining have jo grown and grown and grown. And there's well over a thousand of you here with us today. Um, if you can't, if you're not there, they will, the talks will be available online from tomorrow. Um, in the format, if you've been with us before, is extremely simple. Each of our speakers will speak for seven or eight minutes. Then there'll be some chat between us and then we'll come over to your questions. So please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to come to as many as possible. And uh, now I have enormous pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who, as I said, is Professor Parta Das Gupta. He can genuinely claim to have made history with this groundbreaking report. He has been a professor of economics at Cambridge since 1985, and he's won so many awards, um, there's too many to go into, but it's a lot. Um, in 2002, he was knighted for his services, and a few weeks ago, this long-awaited report, which has completely electrified the environmental world and to a degree, the economic world. So with great pleasure, I hand over to Pata. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you very much, Rosie. It's a pleasure, a pleasure to be here. Um, first of all, I should immediately respond to one of your remarks, um, the query, how do you place a market value to nature? Well, the review doesn't do that for the reason that you suggested in asking the question, which is you can't. Um, we are looking at the worth of nature as it seems to us under our value system and perhaps even beyond. So let's, that's the background. But nature is an asset, our most valuable asset. And as Rosie pointed out, we are embedded in nature. And of course, we are also all asset managers, no matter who we are and where we live, whether we are fishermen or uh, farmers or grazers or households or firms, we have, we have access to assets or to, and we try and do the best we can in managing our assets, given our motivations. Um, the problem is that the motivations that we have are not necessarily aligned to the use that we would put them to. Uh, if the common good was something we aspire to. There is a disjunction between our motivation, uh, the incentives we have under current institutional systems, and uh, the pursuit of the common good. The trick, the, the big, big trick that societies have to solve is to create institutions which offer incentives to people in such a way that the best management practices 
are aligned to the, to the common good. And I'm using the word, term common good for a very good reason here. I'm not talking about social welfare or social well-being, but the common good only because we are now at a stage where we have so devastated Mother Earth that there is a commonality of purpose if only we pay attention to the problem, okay? So it's maybe seems narrow, but in fact, it's extremely important and wide. Why has this gap come about and what is the gap? If we think about nature as providing a wealth, a wealth of goods and services on an annual basis, many of which we don't even, we are not even aware of because they're silent and they're invisible. And they're of course move the processes, take material from one part of the planet to another part of the planet constantly, okay? This complexity of uh, the performance of nature um, is one where if you think of it as providing goods and services, then the overall demand that we make on an annual basis, when I say we, I mean humanity, now I'm thinking globally at this point, the demand we make far exceeds the ability of the biosphere to supply, meet that demand on a sustainable basis. Mm. So there's a gap between supply and demand. Now, which you probably have figured out can't happen because something has to give. Well, what gives is the quality of the biosphere diminishes. We insult the biosphere. It's less productive. And of course, the bigger the gap, the bigger the de decline in the biosphere. And the main worry we have now is that we might be hitting certain floors. Mm. Uh, we don't know where the floors are, macro. But at the local level, many communities have actually experienced the floor. Distress migration is an expression of that fact. Why is there this gap? This gap has occurred actually over a very short period effectively the last 60, 70 years. If you were to ask what happened over this period, one simple way of uh, uh, demonstrating it is to say that the global GDP, in other words, the demand final, the market value of final goods and services we produce, ex exploded by a factor of 15 from 1950 to 2020. In a 70 year period, it's never happened before. And remember, it started in 1950 at a fairly high standard of living, global standard of living, relative to long run history, okay? So the pressure we have actually imposed on the biosphere, now I'm again talking about the global, globally, not at the local level, um, is really of recent origin, but it's huge. The ratio of demand to supply by one estimate is approximately 1.6 which is another way of saying we need 0.6 more earths if we were to, if, if the system were to be able to supply our demand, meet our demand on a sustainable basis. That's a picturesque way of talking about it. So why is that happening? It's happened because much of nature, because of the properties I just now mentioned, namely silence and invisibility and mobility, uh, because nature is on the move all the time. Um, because of these reasons, um, much of nature is free to use, free for us to use. There's nobody charging us for their use. So of course we don't economize on them. It goes without saying, we economize on expensive things, not on cheap things. And of course that has affected the direction of technological change all through history actually, because the cheaper the objects, the more rapacious new technologies are going to be directed towards them because entrepreneurs want to save on expensive inputs of production, not the cheap ones. So it goes together and spirals out of control. So the trick is to in devise institutions to bring the incentives in line with the common good. And at this point, the common good really means here putting out a fire, a gigantic fire that we have started, okay? Now the review, and I'll conclude with that, the review looks at three interrelated um, uh, action, um, if you like, broad transitions that we need. 
One is we have to address this imbalance in a big way. I'm not, uh, these are interconnected, by the way. It's, it, it's not systematic, it's just three bullet points. One is to address this imbalance, the gap between demand and supply. And what, the what much of the review is concerned to do is to decompose the demand into the factors that make for the total demand. And they involve population, the standard of living as measured, let us say, by GDP per capita, per person, and of course, the efficiency with which we transform nature's goods and services into final products, namely GDP. The, these three parameters make for the total demand. On the supply side is, of course, the productivity of the biosphere, okay? So you can see, we now need to look at these factors and the idea is to address each of them. Uh, each of them is important and they all are in, interrelated, of course. That goes without saying, if you perturb standard of living, it will affect population growth. If it affect population growth, it will affect standard of living and the technologies that come about. So they're all under, interrelated. On the whole, on the whole, the economics of climate change has focused on the right-hand side, the supply side. So transition to new forms of energy, cleaner energy. In other words, you get the same amount of goods and services, but without having to, to go into fossil fuels. The, in the review, we, uh, we, it's an assertion of the review and a conclusion that comes out of the analysis that technological solutions are not on for the problem of biodiversity. I should say biodiversity, by the way, is not an asset. It's a characteristic of ecosystem, just as diversity of a portfolio, financial portfolio is not the portfolio itself. It's a characteristic of the portfolio. Biodiversity is important because it, uh, is product it lends the eco ecosystems to, to higher productivity. So the first thing is to, to look at the, address the imbalance and much of the review is concerned with that. The third, second is again related, is to change the way we measure economic success or social success is the right way of putting it. And uh, economics is part of our ethical language is not divorced from it. So I don't have to, when I say economic success, I mean social success, including our, which em is embedded in our values. And what the review shows is that there is in fact, it's not, there is in fact an index, a measure, which picks up what we want, and that is inclusive wealth of nations. That is, it's a wealth means it's value of both of produced capital, the social value of produced capital, human capital, as well as natural capital. It's the last, the natural capital, which is missing in normal economic discourse, which is of course where, like, where I came in. And the third, a bullet point is to find institutions, transformative institutions that can, that can address this imbalance, which at the back of which is the fact that so much of nature is actually so cheap, is zero. In fact, it's negative price because uh, governments, of course, subsidize a great deal of natural capital, the use of natural capital to the tune of four to six trillion US dollars per year. That's huge. I mean, that's really, we're looking at about four, five, six percent of global GDP is essentially a subsidy, subsidy to make us eat more into nature. We are paying ourselves to eat into nature. That's what the colorful way of putting it. The institutions I have in mind, I'll just end with that, is I think it's something I'm, I'm emphasizing in the last few weeks because it's not, it's not, uh, in the, on the public agenda of discourse, despite the fact that we have COP15 coming up um, in, in due court in the, in the next few months, which is there are large chunks of nature which are global public goods. I'm not looking at now a small pond in your back garden. I'm talking about the open seas, the high seas. I'm talking about the, um, the um, tropical rainforests. I'm talking about peatlands. I'm talking about, of course, the atmosphere as a sink for pollution. These three categories are global public goods, and I don't need to explain why. Everybody benefits from their good quality. Now, we don't have any institutions to manage it. Leave aside the atmosphere for the moment because that's being tackled on the economics of climate change, and I'll come back to that at discussion time. But think now of the open seas. They're a global public good, but they're open to access. You don't have to pay a fee to use them. All the transportation that takes place on the, over the, 
across the seas. They, all the oil that is shipped, goods and services shipped, tourism, plus the fishing. Nobody pays a price to tap into that resource, okay? Now, suppose you think in terms of a tax, just as you do, say, a carbon tax in a different context. Rough calculations show that it's going to be a gigantic source of revenue for the international community. That could in turn pay for subsidizing the protection of those public goods which are uh, in, in, within ter national territories. I'm talking now, of course, of the, um, uh, the rainforest, global, the, the uh, tropical rainforest. They happen to be in about four or five countries. Now, given that the output is a public good, and given that these countries are actually diminishing those forests on grounds that is good for their economic development, this is a case for some dialogue. It's no, not, not much good sitting outside and saying how horrible it's ha what's happening in Brazil, how horrible what's happening in the Congo. We ought to be negotiating a price to protect them. So one of the recommendations, which I'm trying to emphasize here, is that we should think big. At the end of the Second World War, a number of international, transnational institutions were created, including the World Bank, IMF, because these are serving global public goods. Likewise, we should now have, think in terms of ha having an institution to whom we discharge responsibility, we trust it, to collect revenue, manage the global commons. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pata. That was just amazing. Um, I was scribbling notes and I realized that we could go on for all night. There's so many things that you raised. Um, we'll come back, I'm sure, to a lot of them in questions. But now I'm very, very pleased to introduce our second speaker, who's Dr. Gabrielle Walker, who's joining us from Camden Town. Um, Gabrielle is an author and environmentalist. She is also a businesswoman who's developing uh, all sorts of range of extraordinary new adaptation and mitigation technologies. She has been an author and she's been a teacher at both at Cambridge and at Princeton. Um, she's written many books, one of which is called Hot Topic, which she wrote with Sir David King, and which was specifically about climate change. But she's also written about Antarctica and and that is a really wonderful book, which I much enjoyed. Um, tonight, she's going to talk about, I hope, something to do with the value of the oceans, which I think always gets very neglected. So Gabrielle, over to you and thank you so much for being here. Thanks very much, Rosie. It's lovely to be here. And thanks, Parker. That was a fantastic description of your uh, excellent report. Um, my work is mainly on climate change. I don't do a lot of work on biodiversity, but I have been getting more concerned about biodiversity the more I dig into the climate change work. And so uh, uh, Rosie's asked me to speak about the oceans. That's what I'm going to do. And I, and I think Penny's going to come along with the land. And hopefully with that, we'll have a uh, good meet to have a conversation later. Um, I wanted to start with the, the Sustainable Development Goal, SDG 14, Life Below Water. So of all of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, this is the one that focuses on the ocean. And I want to mention it because I think the wording is interesting. It's about how to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, sea and marine resources for sustainable development. So the first word is conserve, and then the second one is sustainably use. And I think that goes to the heart of one of the issues that we might discuss later about actually the whole concept of natural capital, how much of it is actually something that we need to conserve and how much of it is that we're trying to use and not deplete. Um, and so I've got a lot of facts for you, and some of them are actually very alarming, so brace yourselves. But before I do that, I just wanted to start with a small story. Um, uh, a year and a half ago, I had the immense good fortune to be volunteering with uh, some researchers, cetacean researchers working on whales. They were working on humpback whales off the coast of Ecuador. So I spent a, a week or two volunteering with them and going out in the boats to their humpback whale stories uh, while I was there. And one day when we'd finished most of the sort of tagging and most of the sort of following the whales around, they actually, they dropped some hydrophones in the water and they gave me headphones and said, listen, you can hear the whales singing. So I'm sitting there on the boat and I put the headphones on and I hear the sound of humpback whales singing. Now I've seen these whales, they've been breaching out amongst us. I've seen them sort of swimming around and now I'm listening to the sounds and it sounds just the way 
you've heard it on the strange whale song descriptions of it you know you can hear it and they were saying oh the clicking is we've identified it's a mother calling to her calf and they were coming from all directions so I'm sitting there in this boat listening to the sound of the whale singing and then I took the headphones off said that was amazing they said let's just jump in the water now we can swim and here's the amazing bit I jumped into the water and I dived down and I could hear the song with my ears it was so extraordinary not just on the headphones but I could hear the song of all the whales around me with my ears and I can still hear it today they gave me a recording of the of the hydrophones but I can hear it in my ears that direct connection to these whales now I'm telling you that because a little bit later that evening while we were having some wine and talking about it I talked to the researcher I said that was such an incredible experience I can still hear it and she looked really sad. And I said, what's the matter? And she said, I've been, I've been doing this research here for 10 years. And in that process, I've been diving as well with and working with the whales. And over that 10 year period, it's gone from almost no plastic nets on the rocks and on the surface of the, of the, of the, of the seafloor to almost completely covered in that, in that period of 10 years because there's been an explosion of fishing and I've talked to the fishermen, they don't want to do it. It costs them money when they lose the nets, but the nets are not biodegradable and they're choking up everything. And here's what she said, and I just hope we can come back to this later. She said, the whales swim up and down from here to Antarctica and back every year. And they, they, they see the coast and they're very sensitized to changes. And they must have seen the change like I did. And she said, I feel embarrassed. I feel embarrassed by what those whales are seeing as they're going up and down here. And I, would, I just want to throw that in because it feels as though there's something in here about just our direct connection to nature. We're embedded in it. And how if we can make that connection, we get different answers to what we really value. So holding that story in your mind, uh, we need the seas. More than 3 billion people rely on the seafood for their primary protein. 90% uh, of global trade is uh, actually carried on the high seas and ships. 40% uh, of the global population lives within 100 kilometers of the sea, absolutely embedded in how we live and how we work, how we do business, how we survive. So that's a, so factor is number one, we need the seas. Next point, we are polluting the seas. So this actually, I'll come to the, 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 the mismatch between demand and supply in a moment, but before I do that, we're also polluting the seas. And this is where the externalities that are not priced come in. Anyone can throw anything into the sea. And so in that case, since we're not pricing it, we're not valuing not just the services it provides, but also the connections that it gives us. So um, uh, uh, roughly 10 million tons of plastics go into the sea every year. That's a, that's a garbage truck every minute. So we've had about 25 minutes of this webinar so far, and that means 25 garbage trucks full of plastics have gone into the sea in the time that we have been speaking and continuing. And by 2050, if we don't stop it, the, the, the calculation is that actually but by weight, be more plastics in the sea than there are fish. I mean, this isn't subtle. This really isn't subtle. Okay, how else are we polluting the ocean? We're polluting it with heat, which sounds like a strange thing to say. But if you look at the amount of heat that the atmosphere has been trapping, the extra heat it's been trapping because of the greenhouse effect, because of the greenhouse gases we're putting into the air, uh, that increased heat, 90% of that heat has gone into the oceans. We're very lucky it has actually, because otherwise everything else would have been warming up very much more significantly. But that 90% that's going to the oceans, it's having physical effects. It's making hurricanes more intense. It's melting uh, sea ice at the poles, which is making the jet streams go extremely weird, which means that we get strange, incredible, intense cold periods in the Northern hemisphere during the winter. Um, uh, so I've heard this called not, not global warming, but global weirding because of these changes. Accelerating, of course, coastal erosion, the warming plus of the seas plus the ice melting is causing rising sea levels. Um, and also shifting currents. There's actually the first signs just recently, we, we sort of thought this was gonna be okay, but the Northern branch of the, of the jet stream, which is what warms parts of Northern Europe, 
it started to weaken very dramatically. And that was the, the, the trigger that caused the, the thing that was highlighted in the, the day after tomorrow, the movie where, where New York froze over. I don't think it's gonna be as dramatic as that, but changing ocean currents and the amount of heat they carry around the world has a big effect on climate. That has an impact on biodiversity. Each of those things, melting a sea ice means that you're radically changing the environment in which a lot of important sea creatures live. Um, also heating is causing coral bleaching. Now, if corals bleach, they, they expel the, the little sea creatures that actually help to um, do photosynthesis and help them make their food. And they can afford to do that and then survive and then sort of reseed re, re again. Um, and it takes about 10 years for them to grow back to where they were. But if bleaching happens every year, they can't grow back. And I was really horrified to hear a, a, a coral researcher who's been working on the Great Barrier Reef for many years saying he doesn't go back there now um, because he can't bear it. Because the, their prediction is that the Great Barrier Reef is probably already gone. It's going to turn into lumps of slime um, and rock. Um, coral reefs aren't just pretty, they're also nurseries for fish. So the fisheries, there's, there's 3 billion people depending on, on proteins for primary, um, the primary source of, um, depending on seafood for the primary source of protein, will suffer from the loss of coral reefs. Changing animal behavior, uh, changing habitats, this is all having an impact on biodiversity directly because of that climate change, that heat pollution in the oceans. We're also polluting the oceans with acid. Carbon dioxide is an acid when it melts in, in when it dissolves into water. And that acid is causing uh, the ocean pH to decrease. The oceans are getting more acidic. That's making it more harder for sea creatures to make their shells, certain sea creatures. And many of those are actually the base of the food chain. So it has a very big effect on biodiversity. And a very important point here, we are so lucky. The oceans have been taking up about 30% of the carbon dioxide that we've been putting into the atmosphere, the extra stuff. And we don't know how long the oceans are going to continue to do that. We're lucky that they have done it because our problems otherwise would be a lot worse, but we don't know if it's gonna to start to reverse or when it's gonna to start to reverse. Okay, next point. So we're polluting the, the sea with heat, we're polluting it with acid, we're polluting it with plastics. Um, we're also depleting the seas. Um, and if uh, overfishing is probably a bigger problem than plastics. It, it's wasteful, it destroys fisheries, it wrecks ecosystems, but just because of the lack of alignment that Partha was talking about earlier, we don't have a way of avoiding it. We don't yet. And we have subsidies, in fact, is the opposite. We actually encourage overfishing with subsidies. Um, and then a lot of the overfishing is done by criminal gangs, often using slave labor. Uh, one estimate I saw was that one in, in five uh, wild caught fish is illegally caught. So I told you to brace yourselves because this is really alarming. And this is also how climate change and biodiversity rhyme, how they relate to one another. I do want to finish by saying we are also, with the kind of institutions that Partha talked about, we are also making really great strides into fixing many of these problems. And the illegal overfishing, there's um, a thing called the Port State Measures Agreement, uh, which is to stop fish, illegal fish being able to be offloaded in ports. And 97 countries have now signed that. Um, for the legal overfishing, the World Trade Organization have been trying for years, for decades, to get to, to a resolution to try and deal with that. And it does look as if they might finally be on the point of it. There's also marine protected areas that we might come back to, which are helping to address the whole conservation issue and the, and the habitats. And as far as climate change is concerned, my other great uh, bugbear, there's so many initiatives now to try to stop the uh, excessive emissions of greenhouse gases and also to reverse the process for climate healing. Um, what one I'd highlight, which involves businesses and also involves shipping, so that's quite a good one because it also relates to the high seas, um, is uh, uh, an initi initiative called uh, Get the Getting to Zero Coalition, which is looking to have the first uh, zero emission ship on the high seas in uh, 10 years time, well, nine years time now in 2030. And that's a business consortium with financing as well. So, and there's lots more of those. So we, we are getting there, but just not fast enough. And, and one of the questions here is how do we put a rocket under all of this? How do we accelerate it? How do we not get so weighed down by horror at the, 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 the pollution and the changes that are happening that we don't actually find the solutions? And that's uh, a big question. Thanks, Rovi.
Gabrielle, thank you so much. That was that was tremendous. And I love that story about the whales. I will be thinking about that for a long time. It says so much. They sound so sad too. Um, our, our final speaker tonight is someone who I'm sure many of you know. Tony Juniper was for many years the in charge of all the campaigns for the WWF. Uh, he now is the chair of Natural England. He's also been special advisor to the Prince of Wales on his sustainability trust. Uh, Tony's the author of many books and particularly for tonight, um, his book, uh, What Has Nature Done For Us?, which has got the great subtitle, How Money Really Does Grow On Trees. Mm -hmm. Tony tonight is going to be talking about why conservation isn't working, which I think is such an important point. Um, what is the chasm between ecology and economics? Tony, over to you and thank you for being here. Thank you, Rosie. A great pleasure to be able to share the conversation this evening with Gabrielle and, and Parter and to uh, offer a few reflections on this question of, of why conservation uh, doesn't seem to be working yet. And you've already heard some of the statistics this evening about the ongoing degradation of the environment. And, you know, I've been working in this field now for 36 years this year, 37, 37 years this year, goodness me. And, uh, you know, one of the things that is noticeable uh, over that long period of, of activity in the conservation, uh, sustainability and environmental fields is how the reports that are monitoring the situation in relation to climate change and biodiversity and ecosystems, they just get worse and worse. And so, you know, this goes back to literally the 1970s and the data that we, we've been gathering. We've got some pretty long term data sets now on some of these questions. And the remarkable thing is how, you know, they just keep accumulating ever more knowledge as to how things are, are traveling in the wrong direction. So in this country, for example, we have very good data concerning populations of butterflies and farmland birds, amongst other things. And we can see from those, you know, the curves over time uh, showing an index of decline uh, for, for many of those once common species. And then at the global level, we, we have the red data book process, uh, whereby scientists in different disciplines and experts across different groups of animals and plants come together to assess those that are in danger of extinction. And the list gets longer every time there is another review. And then in relation to different ecosystems, we have pretty good data now augmented by remote sensing from satellites telling us of the decline of forests. Now, this subject has been something that the world has been wringing its hands over since the late 1970s with early initiatives to stem the decline of tropical forests in particular. And in 2014, the world came together at the United Nations and adopted a target to halve forest loss between 2014 and 2020. And actually it's gone the other direction by over 40%, mostly in the tropics again. And then when it comes to that really big, broad cutting global issue of climate change, when the treaty that said we should avoid dangerous global warming was agreed in 1992, we had 355 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we're now at 415 and it's going up year on year. And so for me, uh, the question came a few years ago, Rosie, and thank you for mentioning what has nature ever done for us? Because that book was my attempt to answer the question of why, despite all of that knowledge, do we still carry on as before? And, you know, I, I reached the conclusion that actually the problem wasn't so much in environmental information or indeed even in the setting of environmental targets. The problem was really in economics and the extent to which the world had kind of assumed, either explicitly or implicitly, that looking after the environment actually would harm economic development and it would be a break on growth, it would harm competitiveness, it would slow down attempts to reduce poverty globally, and it would harm job creation. Those were all the reactions that came in the wake of proposals to reduce pollution, to protect nature, to restore ecosystems, that economic narrative was always there. And you could sum it up as environmental damage is really the price of progress. It's regrettable that we're losing all these beautiful animals and plants, but it's inevitable because that's what progress is. And then you find, and it started about 20 years ago, the glimmers of a new narrative 
beginning to build, uh, certainly amongst the academics to begin with, started with the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. That was followed by a famous review called The Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, work of Robert Costanza, a famous ecological economist and his colleagues, setting out some of the values of nature in economic terms. And then in this country, we had the Natural Capital Committee and culminating now in Parter's fantastic review, which has really brought the discussion to new attention and crucially, a piece of work that's been commissioned by one of the country, one of the world's leading uh, finance ministries, the, the UK Treasury, our country's Treasury. And so this is now leading to a new discussion and about time, because that idea that looking after nature was harmful to the economy, I describe this as the gravest misconception in human history, because in fact, the opposite is true. The more we degrade the environment and all of the services that it provides, the more we imperil economic development and poverty reduction and all of those other things that come with a healthy economy. Nature underpins our food security, stable climate, water supply, pollinating insects, healthy soils. That's what feeds us and we're degrading all of those. Fish in the ocean, of course, they're wild species that are still exploited, but they underpin about $275 billion worth of global GDP and support many millions of people's employment, plus feed many poor people. Water security, essential for all aspects of the economy. Water security is not about taps and bottles, it's about rainforests and healthy soils. And the more we degrade those, the more we imperil our food security. And of course, in dealing with climate change, there is no way on earth we're going to meet 1.5 degrees of warming without halting the degradation of forests and soils. And indeed, there's every good um, evidence uh, uh, body now to tell us that we have to reverse that. And then, of course, there's public health and the extent to which we benefit from healthy natural environments. And indeed, the extent to which healthy natural environments also suppress disease. And, you know, many people have made this connection and Partha made it in his report. The fact that the risk of pandemics is going up with environmental degradation. These two things are closely related. And if you look at the impact of COVID-19 economically, I looked at a figure today produced by the Judge Business School here in Cambridge. Their mid-range estimate for the costs of uh, COVID-19 on the economy is in the order of $26 trillion. How can we possibly believe that looking after nature is economically irrational when damaging it is causing that kind of economic consequence. So this is a moment when we have to pause and reflect and begin to think about the future in very different ways. And it requires a revolution in thinking. The nature and climate emergencies are named because they are emergencies, that they're not just simply slogans from campaigners. We need to do something about these things very quickly. And from what I've seen over many years of activity on all of this, we have to drive this into the heart of economic thinking. And so that revolution in ideas really needs to be there, not just in the environment department. The toolkit we have, and we've known about it for some time, we can regulate and set targets, and we do that to more or less good effect, including here on climate change. We can change the tax system. We can reduce taxes on employment and start levying higher taxes on carbon and waste and other kinds of pollution. We can switch spending from infrastructure of an old kind and into green infrastructure, which might preserve our water security, for example. And we can change subsidies. And instead of incentivizing damage to the environment, we can start moving it into the recovery for the environment. And we're doing that here. And we've also got trading schemes, which can create markets in environmental improvements. And so all of those things are available, but we now need to have the revolution in economics. And I'm so delighted to see Partha's report as now adding to that weight of voices. But I do wonder um, whether this message has really got into the economics departments in universities yet, and indeed very widely uh, across the world. But at least we've now got the discussion moving and a new narrative is taking hold. And thank goodness for that. And uh, I do hope that it now leads to that shift, which is so fundamentally needed. Tony, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, all of you. And I can see questions are coming in from everywhere. Um, Pata, you talk in the re review about a supranational institutional arrangements that we need, and you, you referred to the Marshall Plan and what we set up after the Second World War. How do you see us making global agreements about this? Well, it's hard for me to, it's in, impossible for me to spell, say it now. I mean, you know, it's speculate what will happen, but it has to be done. After all, 
governments did, nations did come together, admittedly only a few, to create the World Bank and the IMF and it, take a life on their own. And if really high quality civil servants and scientists go to join such an institution, that would really help. We just have to have it because the global commons, as both Gabriel and Tony emphasized, are unmanaged. Mm. Or in, in the case of the geographically confined ones, they're mismanaged because mm. they are food, food for money. I mean, they, you know, they destroy it to create ranches and, and so forth. So that has to be done. If they're either that or pretend that these are not global public goods. I mean, the logic, economic logic dictates that we have to have institutions to manage it. And it, uh, the idea that nations come together and have agreements which are not binding is behind so much of the complaints that Tony had justifiably uh, directed at, at uh, global behavior. Yes, and um, just before I come to you, Gabrielle, I mean, what, what seems to be at the heart of so much of what you all three of you have said is that, you know, because of the way that capitalist economy works, we see these things as free. So there has to be a huge mental shift to saying, actually, they're not free, there's something different. And that strikes me as very, very difficult as well. Well, I'm not sure that it's entirely the issue is capitalism. No. Um, the socialists, I mean, the, yeah, the Soviet yeah. Union was yeah, as predatory yeah. over its natural capital yeah. as any other system of the world. Okay. It's not bad, it's that we are free riding. That's the issue. Nobody's taking responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so hence, you really need collective responsibility. It's something that we really have to come to grips with. We solve community problems. Little villages come together in third world countries. My gosh, the number of communitarian institutions which are, who have been created over the centuries to husband their local resources is huge. There's a, uh, the review goes into it at length. But we somehow have not been able to channel that kind of attitude to preserving natural capital at the global level. Okay, and one, one question also that's just come in from Kate Palm, um, Palminter um, to you, but again, Professor Prescriptor, how do you think that the, your review will influence the COP agenda? <laughs> it's not for me to say. I'm far removed from government. Mm. Oh, I don't think that's true, but anyway, I hope you're very involved with government. Gabrielle, what's your reaction to how we, I don't want to use the word police, but how do we, as a world, get on top of this. You're right, we're getting on top of emissions, but this is... We're, we're not getting on top of emissions, but at least we're, we're, we're going in the right direction and, the, and okay. the, the, the appetite is increasing and the, and the cohorts are increasing and the, the potential solutions are increasing and the energy behind them. And I wanted to mention the, I mean, you just said, uh, you said COP, but didn't really say what it is. And so let's, uh, let's put it out there. There's a UN convention on the biological diversity happening, I believe in May. Uh, COP15, uh, and, and this is, uh, I, I, I have high hopes for the climate change COP that's happening in Glasgow this year. And I also, I have to say, I have high hopes for this one that, that's focusing on biodiversity, partly because of um, the, the Sculptor report, but also because of this, this increasing realization. In a way, climate change and biodiversity have a terrible impact on each other. Climate change causes biodiversity loss and vice versa. But I think that the realization of the, the holes that we're in with climate change can also has a, have a positive effect on the, of the realization of the hole that we're in in biodiversity. And so I am, I'm sensing in all of the work I'm doing, the conversations I'm having, I am sensing an increasing appetite to, to look at this, to understand this, to do something about it. And it, there is a great danger to say someone should do something. I've banned that from all my meetings now. The question is, what do we do? But one of the things that we do is make sure that it's not just a narrative of, oh, God, it's getting worse. Oh, God, it's getting worse. Oh, God, it's getting worse. There's nothing we can do. But, but there are plenty of mechanisms to fix this. There are plenty of ways to do it. And, and the energy and the effort needs to be poured into figuring out who needs to do what to make it happen. Tony. Um, so many thoughts and, and so many questions um, coming uh, in, in that little exchange. Rosie, one, one thing, I've, Parth has already touched on this, um, th this idea that capitalism at the, is at the heart of the problem. I, I've, I've um, you know, debated with environmentalists on this subject for many years, and quite a few environmentalists do say that if we are going to, to reverse these environmental trends, 
then we have to abandon capitalism. And I've reached the conclusion that that's probably not true. And Arthur touched on this, um, you know, look at what the alternative has been until now. And, you know, Soviet style um, communism was even more damaging to the environment than capitalist economies. You know, we, we, we um, have uh, somewhat more uh, attention to these issues than was the case in that kind of economic system. And so, you know, this is not about um, whether, you know, it's about overthrowing capitalism. It's about how we're going to adapt that system to be able to cope with this massive decarbonization and recovery of nature, which we now have to invest in. And, you know, it, it, I think what we want is honest capitalism. If you start taking some of the numbers that come with these values of ecosystem services and start to feed those in to how we model economic development and how we measure GDP and go beyond GDP, then you'd realize actually our economy isn't growing at the moment, it's shrinking. Mm -hmm. And actually Robert Costanza has done some great work on this, uh, estimating how the value of global ecosystem services at the moment is actually far bigger than global GDP, but we only measure the GDP and we're not measuring the decline of the natural capital. So we finished up with the wrong answer as a result of not having the right data in there. And so I think, you know, a lot of this is about measurement. And once we can come with some metrics which replace, you know, the, 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 the proxies for consumption that we use at the moment and good lives within environmental limits is, is one way of, of, yeah. of putting it. If we can start to measure that, then I think we can harness the tools of capitalism, which are extremely powerful uh, to different ends. Uh, and that's the task at hand. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's, that's incredibly interesting. I mean, I suppose I meant it from the point of view that we seem to live in a world which makes people think that to be successful, they have to grow. And our ways yeah. that we've grown up to now have meant using yeah. more of the world. Um, exactly. When in fact growth in human happiness and fulfillment and growth in the efficiency of how we're using resources, those things can all be growing as well. It's not necessarily even the idea that growth is bad. It's a question of what we're measuring, to my mind. And Potter, do you see that there's a new, a new type of GDP that the world could get behind? Yes, the review actually spends most of its yeah. time leading to it, the, the final chapter of the analytical yeah. part. We call it inclusive wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really the wealth of nations, the wealth of communities that we ought to be thinking about, which is, of course, the assets that we hold, the value of the assets. Now, you're not going to be measuring wealth. It's not going to be happen. That's not going to happen. What you're going to do is to keep an inventory of your assets and see which ones are going down, which ones are going up. That's okay. the idea. And of course, to the extent that you can value them, then you can aggregate and create a wealth index. The United Nations Environment Program has been much involved in that. There have been three inclusive wealth reports in 2012, 2014, 2018. So it's very early days, but there is a very theoretically robust, theoretically completely kosher um, index. That is to say, it's not an ad hoc one I've just thrown in saying, well, it's wealth. You can show that wealth and well -being, human well-being, or even if you include non-human well-being, that the notion of wealth corresponds to that. So if one goes up, the other goes up. And that's what uh, Tony was asking for, yeah. a metric which will do that. But at the moment, I should just simply say that at the moment, we don't even need to go that far. We are in such a crisis situation uh, globally, you know, the gap that I was talking about between mm -hmm. demand and supply, that we should regard that as the urgent matter. Mm -hmm. And in place, first, in, the, in, other, in other words, the onus ought to be in rich countries to justify actions, investments, which are anti-green. Yeah. The owners should be the other way, as it were, rather than nature coming as a supplicant saying, gosh, don't forget me. So that, that takes us on to some of the questions now coming in from the audience. Um, Katie, there's one for you, um, Pata. How do we get policymakers, including resistant governments, to listen and put into effect your economic solutions? And how can we as the general public health, but help? But, and it would also add this level of urgency that we have now. Well, previously, it's, it's really presumptuous on my part to answer because it would suggest that I know more things than the questioner does or anybody else in the audience, and I don't. But um, the question arose about capitalism. It's actually what we are after is essentially something like citizenship, freedom of the citizen to be able to complain. 
Now, we happen to be very fortunately living in societies like ours here, uh, in uh, those societies where we are, have that access. We do have that freedom to complain, to urge, to encourage our political leaders because we elect them. Now, if we spend all our time on other matters, then what do we expect? We are not exploiting our power, the citizen's power, towards the common good. Uh, we are instead doing, moving in different directions. Now, of course, there are countries where the citizen doesn't have a voice. So go without saying, there's nothing to be done about that unless pressure is put from outside. That this is not just a luxury that citizens have the right to voice their concerns. The farmer, the poor peasant has a right to his concern or the indigenous population in the middle of the forest says, look, this is my home. This is where I was raised. This is my you know, sacred nature and that I'm being evicted or may perhaps even being killed and he doesn't have a voice. We need to recognize this is happening and take action in the sense we can only work through our political leaders. And we do have that power in this country and in Western democracies. So it seems to me that's where the action lies in us. Yes. Um, Gabrielle, you wanted to come in. Yeah, it's just that I, I wanted to add as well as the, the, the political acti activity, and I, I, I heartily endorse what, what Partha was saying. Um, since we're on the topic of, of economic instruments and, and, and the role that those economic, how powerful those can be, as Tony mentioned earlier, um, I, I think that, that that's one of the things that's actually changed, starting to change the tide in the whole climate change game. That, uh, that the the entire finance community this has gone mainstream and one of the reasons it went mainstream was a, was a frightened realization of the of the direct risks to assets that climate change posed in terms of if, if you were or something important in your supply chain was in the way of a forest fire or a flood then you were going to lose money but also the transition costs because that means that the policy changes are inevitable as, as the the climate change um, commitments take hold and therefore are you ready for that and I, I can see that coming for biodiversity as well I'm also I've been hearing uh, people talking about biodiversity bonds to kind of relate relate to green bonds and and also a requirement for, for companies to have to declare not just their emissions now but also the implications of their of their uh, operations for biodiversity and interestingly I just I think today um, in the, the the European Union announced it was a, the sustainable finance disclosure regulation yeah. which is um, uh, not, not only do you have to declare what your risks are associated with environmental and social and governance of your operations, but you also have to disclose what your impact is on making those issues worse. And so I think that that's something that's really got corporate attention, it's got finance attention, and even as individual citizens, just as Partha was saying, as individual citizens, we can write to our MPs, but if you've got a pension, you can write to your pension um, um, fund and say how exactly you're investing my money. And yeah. that is a fire hose of money. You think one, one little pension doesn't make a difference, but I've spoken to pension fund trustees who said, we don't get, ever get letters from, from our, 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 um, our members. If we got three or four, we'd assume that there were thousands out there who were thinking the same thing, we'd know that we had to act. And so, you know, I think that there are many ways in which that kind of citizen action using money as a way to make sure that we're investing in the solutions and not in the problems can really be very powerful. Thank you, thank you very much. Tony, I've, I've got quite a lot of questions to do with Britain in terms of rewilding, reforesting mm. and increasing biodiversity that way. As the chair of Natural England, I know you're very keen on wilding, rewilding. What's your view about what part it can play? What part it can play? Well, um, at the heart of the um, mission at Natural England, uh, these days is, is nature recovery. And that may sound obvious, but actually for the last 70 years that organisations in our position working for government have been in existence, we've actually been trying to slow down the losses uh, through conservation. We've been establishing small protected areas for the most part, trying to hang on to remnant populations of rare species. We're now getting into the process of nature recovery for all the reasons we've talked about this evening, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, this immense value that we get from the natural world for carbon capture, water purity, public health and well-being, uh, the extent to which it underpins food and the uh, adaptation to climate change, reducing flood risk, all of that stuff has got massive value, which is why now we believe as a country it's rational to invest in that recovery. And this does include uh, elements of, of what some people call rewilding. I call it 
nature recovery because it's much broader than that. So some ecosystems we might wish to recover, hay meadows, for example, they won't be wild in the sense of being left alone, they will be managed, but they will be managed for biodiversity and other ecosystem services, but not just left uh, completely alone. Whereas leaving things completely alone is an approach that will be taken in other places. And there are some fantastic and inspiring examples of what can happen uh, through that approach, including at NEP in, in Sussex, where you know the famous rewilding work there is revealing these incredible pleasant surprises about nature's ability to come back if we give it a chance. So this is really what we're trying to do uh, at Natural England. And this is very much a process built upon partnerships with landowners, with farmers, with water companies, house builders, infrastructure providers, obviously the conservation groups, local government, and trying to pull all of those influential asset managers as Partha mm -hmm. describes them and to get them to be working together in particular landscapes to bring back much of what's gone. And so that, that, that's really uh, what we're trying to do now. And um, obviously, you know, as a government agency working closely with departments across the piece, and I just cannot tell you how pleased I am to see this level of engagement from Treasury, yeah. because at the end of the day, it's the economic frame which sets the environmental possibility and for Partha's work to be delivered from there, I think is opening some new doors. And I'm, I'm so delighted about that. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. Um, I can't quite believe that we've managed to get through pretty much all of this without mentioning the word food, given that I do food politics and given that food is the biggest driver of the loss of insect life and soil life. Um, I know that there's a lot in your review, Pasha, about this. Um, and I'm <laughs> in a very short space of time. Could you say something about the impact of the food system and how how you think that needs to change in the future? Well, the, 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 it varies from place to place, goes without saying. Um, so it has to be broad-based kind of answer. But overall, of course, we are mismanaging the food system in a dramatic way because the subsidies we pay to destroying um, natural, natural capital, as it were, in order to be able to grow food is, um, is huge. Uh, currently, for example, something like 30% of food from source to sink is wasted. Now, if you tell something is tell an economist something is wasted yeah. to that extent, his, his or her first reaction is going to be, well, they've been priced too low. Yeah. And they've been priced too low is because you're subsidizing the inputs to produce it. Okay. Now there is before that, so that's one area. The other is, of course, we are preventing a, a, a new, new new technology from taking over, which will be cleaner. GM is one potential source. It has been studied by scientists for quite some time. Uh, that's another area. That's to, to raise the productivity uh, of soil. But meanwhile, we have really wasted a huge amount of resources producing food, which we need, need not have. So that's one broad basket. But there is something that we really need to, I'd like to end with, in, at least from my side, uh, transmitting an idea that I've learned from my ecology friends, which is there is a tension between the what the MEA that Tony referred to, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, called provisioning services, which, which are the ones which give us food, timber, uh, fibers, and so forth, the stuff that we directly need. And the other services, the maintenance and regulating, regulating services that nature provides, which include, for example, mm -hmm. um, decomposition of waste. <clears throat> water cycle and so forth, the ones that Tony was emphasizing and Gabriel was emphasizing as well. There is a tension between the two. If you expand one without thinking, you're destroying the others. Mm -hmm. And the trouble is these services are also complementary with one another. So the natural instinct of the economist is we can substitute our way out of problems. That's not gonna work with nature because she is a very integrated complex system. So if you destroy one part of it, yeah. other parts come crashing down. So th these, that's what we mean by complementarities amongst the factors. So there is an inherent tension and we haven't actually helped that tension, aided that tension, eased that tension. Instead, we have exacerbated the tension by subsidizing inputs for the production of food, including insecticides and the whole lot of that. 
that is so interesting. Um, that is just such an extraordinary thought to leave us on. Um, I want to ask you all, because we've done it all the way through this series, that if, uh, if there's one thing that you want our audience and us to, to do or to, to think, um, take away as such from here, it could be, in your case, part of just read your review, which I would absolutely recommend that everybody at least reads the two-page summary, because it's really nicely written and it's really easy to take on board. Um, but what, what would you, Gabrielle, I'll start with you, what would be your takeaway? My takeaway is, uh, I think the, the energizing power of connecting to nature is the driving force that will take us from the despair of this is all going wrong to the kind of energy that means that we can create the new institutions, we can make a collective nuisance of ourselves sufficiently that we will actually solve this. So I think that's the magic touch. And, and when I say um, uh, we can create the institutions, I don't mean that everyone runs off and makes their own United Nations, but I do mean that that, that mismatch between we know what needs to happen and how do we make it happen. I know where the engine for that comes from and it comes from a powerful passion that comes from anything. Go, go, go walk in the park, see a tree, listen to a bird singing and really remember how embedded we are in this. And I tell you, it just gives such power to change. Thank you, Tony. I think my, my, my thought is, is the extent to which all of us need to be asking for the changes that are needed, really. Yeah. And, and so this can't be left to scientists and, and academics alone. They, they are bringing the ideas and presenting us with the evidence. But in the end, the shift that's needed to move beyond doing things how we've done them before is going to have to come from the citizens. And, you know, that there are different with some of them have been mentioned this evening. So welcoming politicians moving towards zero carbon policies and nature recovery policies and asking for that, uh, shopping in ways where you're asking the questions around, for example, as Tesco's got deforestation in its supply chain, and if they have asked them to stop it or shop elsewhere. And similarly, you know, this awesome power of finance and ensuring that our savings are being deployed in ways which are adding up to, to, to being part of the solution. And that is happening. In fact, all of those things are happening. Policy is changing, the corporates are changing and finance is changing. But the more we all say that's a very good thing and we want some more, please, the quicker it's gonna go. Thank you, Pata. Well, it's really amplification of what Gabriel and uh, Gabriel and Tony have just now said, which is we should really exploit two things. Our sense of citizenship, which we all too, alas, all too frequently ignore. And two, the new technology of being able to communicate with millions of people with the, you know, with the tap of a key on our computer PCs. Now we are the huge amount of communication is taking place, but what's the content of that communication? If you take this, the problem that we are discussing here seriously, you can't have it both ways. Of course, you can dismiss it saying, well, I've got one life, I'm going to do it. That's my business. I don't care what Tony Juniper says or what Gabriella says. Or what people say mind that. These. <laughs> but if you do take it seriously, then we do have the citizen in a free society has a huge, huge uh, capital asset in being able to communicate. And not, not in anger, but in persuasion. Exactly. To the, that's, uh, it can be done. Mm. It has to be done. Otherwise, we are, we are sunk. Our, our great grandchildren will be sunk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to all three of you, to Gabriel Walker, Tony Juniper and Pata Das Gupta for what's been an absolutely fantastic hour of things. And I know that I will be watching this back again because you can all get it online tomorrow. Um, the Rath Rathbones, as ever, have been wonderful partners for us. And thank you very much for your involvement in this. And Thank you very much also for putting out the Planet Papers. I know they're going to be online tomorrow. We've done, you've produced them for every session we've done and they're really good. Thank you also to our audience. And there's lots of you out there and thank you very much for joining in. Um, join us again in four weeks today on April the 14th, where we'll be looking at how to live in the cities sustainably, but please um, get everyone's books, read the review um, and join in. And as Gabriel says, and Parter says, we are all citizens of this planet and between us, we can make the change. Thank you all very, very much indeed. And good night. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night to you all. Bye-bye.